Uh, so we're excited today to have Cheng Chen. Uh, he's a staff engineer at Single Store, um, where he's been there for about five years now. So he's here to talk about the, the you know the data system they're building at Single Store. Again, the idea here is to put into context all the things that we talked about this semester uh, and show that how when you build a real database system, this is actually what they actually look like, the things we covered this semester. Although things in bus top are not going to be as efficient as you would do in, in a real system. And Chang will discuss some of those things. Um, so in addition to being at MemSQL for five years, he also did his undergrad at Xinhua in computer science. So we're in good hands here for him to talk about their data system in addition to how they've added vector support. So. With that, Cheng, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. I can say also, too, for the class, if you have any questions, raise your hand, uh, and then we'll, we'll call on you, and then you can ask your question. And then feel free to do this at any time. That way, Cheng's not talking to himself for an hour on Zoom. OK? All right, Cheng, the floor is yours. Go for it. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Hi, everyone. My name is Cheng, and uh, I'm a software engineer at Single Store, working the core execution team. Yeah, so as Andy said, if you have any questions during the talk, feel free to just interrupt me. Yeah, my, my talk today has a controversial title. Do you need a specialized vector database? So the last decade has seen a remarkable rise in specialized, vector, specialized database systems. There are systems for transaction processing, data warehousing, time series analysis, full text search, et cetera. And now the hype goes to vector databases. A belief has taken hold that a single general purpose database is not capable of running varied workloads at a reasonable cost with strong performance, and at the level of scale and concurrency people demand today. There is value in specialization, but the complexity and the cost of using multi multiple specialized, specialized databases in a single application environment is becoming apparent. This realization is driving developers and IT decision makers to seek databases capable of powering a broader set of use cases. So Single Store is a distributed general purpose SQL database designed to run a broad set of use cases with good performance. In the first half of, this, of my talk, I will provide an architecture overview of Single Store, explaining, why, explaining how we can buy both low store and a column store to support both operational and analytical workloads, and detailing our indexing and filtering design. In the second half of the talk, I will take a deep dive into the upcoming vector index feature and explain how we integrate it into our indexing and filtering design. So let's start with single store overview. Yeah, so Single Store is a distributed general purpose SQL database. It is capable of handling both operational and analytical workloads. It can run both TPCH and TPCDS competitively with data warehouses. And it can also run TPCC competitively with operational databases. It is cloud native that the architectures are designed to take advantage of elastic cloud infrastructure. It can scale out to efficiently utilize hundreds of hosts, thousands of cores, and tens of terabytes of RAM, while still providing a user experience similar to a single host SQL database, such as Oracle or SQL Server. We have hundreds of customers with demanding production workloads in large finance, telecom, energy, and tech companies. So to justify what I said, that single store can handle both operational and analytical workloads with good performance. Here is a TPCC and TPCH number taken from our VLDB 2020, 2022 paper. Our TPCC numbers are competitive with a popular cloud operational database, and it scales well with the cluster size. On the TPCH numbers, so our TPCH numbers are competitive with two popular cloud data warehouses. So the key differentiator here is that we can do both operational and analytical workloads very well. Even better, we can run those workloads concurrently with good performance. On the other hand, cloud data warehouses only support data warehousing and can't run TPCC. And cloud operational databases can run both benchmarks but it performs orders of, orders of magnitude worse on TPCH. 
So let's look at the product overview of single store. So we have very fast data pipeline to ingest data into single store. We have a three tier architecture. The top tier is a very fast in memory rock free skip list based low store. The second tier is our own disk LSM based com store resides in SSD. The bottom tier is an optional shared storage for code data. We use the same storage for all tables, and it works well for hybrid workloads. We are multimodal, meaning that we can handle a broad set of workloads with just one single database. We can handle operational analytical workloads concurrently with good performance. We support structured relational data, unstructured JSON data, geospatial, time series, full text, etc. And our vector search support is coming. We are compatible with MySQL and also support Mongo API. In addition, we have strong extensibility support, allowing users to write Watson functions or external functions. We use a shared nothing architecture that scales out very well while providing a user experience similar to a single host SQL database. Chang, are you going to talk about skip list a little bit or no? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. uh, can I say the question again? Are you going to talk about skip list a little bit or no? No, I'm not going to talk about skip list. OK, so for everyone in class, it's just it's a probabilistic B plus tree. It's like, like you kind of flip the coin and you decide whether you branch or not. We, uh, I'll, I'll send something afterwards. Oh, awesome. All right, another question. If um, I have a question about this slide, how is it shared nothing if there's a blob storage at the bottom? Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, good question. So, um, so basically, each node will have uh, its own partition, but unless the 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 cloud storage basically provides unlimited uh, unlimited storage that we just upload upload the blobs to to the blob storage. So I think what you're saying is that every node basically manages its own buckets in in the blob store blob storage, and that yes. they're they're the only ones that can read and write to it. So so it's like an infinite disk, but it's still shared nothing partitioned. Yeah, but basically each leaf node has a, each each partition has like a designated leaf node, so it's kind of shared nothing. But each each leaf node has unlimited storage. Got it. Are you going to talk about the hierarchical structure of the of query execution with the trees or no? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go deep into the query execution part. OK, awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's look at the cluster architecture as single store. So single store is a horizontally partitioned shared nothing database with an optional shared storage for core data. There are two types of nodes, aggregators and leaves. So clients connect to aggregators and aggregators are responsible for handling core realization and planning and also coordinate distributed queries. So leaves hold the actual data partitions and perform most computation. So tables are hash partitioned by a usual configurable set of columns called shard key. Each leaf holds several partitions of data. Each partition is either a master partition, which can serve both read and write or a replica partition, which can only serve read. This enables fast query execution for point reads and query shapes that do not require moving data between leaves. So let's look at an example. So here is a um, cluster with one aggregator and three leaves. The table is sharded into three partitions, and each leaf holds one master partition and one replica partition. So let's say that let's say now the usual query is aggregator with select average A from db.t, the aggregator will query each leaf with select sum A, count A from each table partition. It then computes the total sum divided by the total count and returns it to the user. So this simple, this kind of simple queries do not need any data movement. So certain query shapes require moving the data. For example, in distributed drawing, in the simple case where the shard key matches, the aggregator can just push down the execution to individual partitions. But if the shard key does not match, the leaves needs to redistribute the data by broadcast or reshuffle. 
Optimizer also needs to take this data movement cost into account. And certain queries also need to, trans to be transformed in order to be efficiently executed. So sing single store is able to run all TPCH and TPCDS queries with good performance. Yeah, and, uh, any questions so far? I think we're good. Yeah, so now, now let's focus on a single node and see how it can handle hybrid workloads. So let's start with what hybrid workloads look like. So OLAP workloads involve complex data analysis. It requires scanning hundreds of millions to trillions of loads in a second. On the other hand, OLTP workloads involve transaction processing and real-time updates. It requires writing or updating millions of loads per second. Real-time analytic workloads involve running both OLAP and OLTP workloads concurrently. It requires running complex interactive queries over large changing data sets concurrently with high throughput, low latency read and write queries with predictable response times. So we are looking for a unified table storage that is efficient for both analytical workloads and the transactional workloads. We know Column Store has good scan performance and is good for analytical is good for analytical workloads. So the main idea is to design a table storage good for hybrid workloads. So the main idea to design a table storage good for hybrid workloads is to use the operational optimized Column Store. It is basically a Column Store with modifications to better support selective reads and writes in a manner that has very little impact to its, to its compression and table scan performance. So let's look at how this is implemented. So each single store table has an in-memory low store segment to store small writes and avoid creating small sorted runs across many files. Loads are first written into in-memory low store segment. Background flusher periodically flushes loads from in-memory se low store segment to a new column store segment. Background module merges column store segments incrementally to maintain a logarithm number of sorted runs. In the case of batch loading, loads are directly written to a new column store segment without touching row store segment. So all column store segments are immutable. Delete and update will mark the loads in will just mark the loads as deleted in the segment and move it in move it to the in-memory load store segment. The deleted bits are stored in the in-memory metadata table. So this part is very similar to the existing LSM. Do we, do we have any questions so far? No, I, I just want to put the context of the class. So, so I think lecture four, five, we talked about log structure storage. This is basically the same thing. The LSM is just log structure merge tree. We're not, we, we ignore the merge tree part. So again, they're just buffering all the writes, but instead of then writing out the, the disk page, the, the block as row stores uh, that, you know, for the log structure stuff, the SS tables, they're storing it as, as a column store. So the basic idea is they're synthesizing the row store and, and the log structure stores together. So you can do faster yeah. writes in log structure, and then you do the faster scans on the, on the column stores. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll talk about the fast scan, fast, fast way to find and uh, seek into any loads in the comp store later. So uh, it, it requires effort from all layers in order to support hybrid workloads with good performance. I will briefly mention the optimizations we do for storage layer, but I'm not going to go deep into this. Our design is optimized for tiered storage. So all blobs are immutable so that we don't need to change a blob in S3, which can be slow. Flash and module runs in the background, and there is no blob writes on commit. It only writes to write ahead lock. Our storage also allows for out-of-order out replication. This allows small transactions to be committed without waiting for big transactions. Yeah, so next, let's look at the optimizations we do at query layer to support hybrid workloads. So our column store is optimized for analytical workloads. Some optimizations we do are vectorized execution, where we execute on a batch of loads using SMID instruction. We also support encoded execution, where we can execute on encoded data for some filters 
glue buy and hash join operations. We also do late materialization where we only in, we only decode loads and columns that are needed. So these optimizations are kind of common. They, they can be commonly found in other OLAP systems. So because our column store also needs to be optimized for operational workloads, we do some optimizations that are less commonly found in other OLAP systems. So this, this operation, the goal of these operations is to allow us to find to fund and seek to individual loads efficiently. So for example, all the column encodings we use are seekable. It allows us to efficiently read at a specific load offset without decoding all the loads. We store the segment metadata in memory. It includes the min max of a segment, the min max and deleted bits for each segment. And it allows us to run efficient segment emanation to reduce the number of segments to scan. Are those, are those the zone maps? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's kind yeah. of the zone map coding other data, other vendors. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. Thanks. So a sort key can also be specified on each column store table. Uh, when it's specified, Flasher will sort the loads within a segment based on the sort key. Module will merge the segments incrementally to maintain a logarithm number of sorted rows. And the sort key can allow for more efficient segment animation. Moreover, we support secondary hash indexes for, e for efficient point access. I will discuss this in more details next. So because our deleted loads is stored, because the deleted loads in a segment is stored as a bit vector in the segment metadata. So while this representation, while this representation is optimized for vectorized access during analytical queries, they can also introduce a source of contention when modifying the segment metadata. So single store implements a low level rocking mechanism to avoid blocking during transactional workloads. This is done by first moving the loads to be updated and or deleted to the in-memory load store segment. Another optimization we do is full query code generation. It's kind of beneficial for both OLAP and OLTP workloads. The first time a query is wrong, single store will optimize and compile the query into machine code. When the same query is wrong in the future, we will directly run the machine code. All SQL queries are parameterized. The constants in this query are replaced by placeholders. For example, the constant one and ABC will each be replaced by a runtime parameter. This allows for the same query plan to work for any constants. And the compilation is done by force code and a C++ like MPL code in the execution plan or for the execution plan. The C++ like MPL code is then flattened into assembly like MPC opcodes, which is then passed to LLVM to compile the machine code in the background. We start executing the query by interpreting the MPC opcodes and switch to machine code during query execution when compilation finishes. This optimization is very effective for evaluating complicated expressions. Yeah, any questions so far? So let me just put it in the context of the class, because we don't we don't discuss query compilation or code generation in the intro class. We test this in the advanced class. Think of like in bus tub, you have everyone in the you have to implement the next function. So so when you run a query, you're just calling next, 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 going down the tree and pulling tuples up. But then inside of the of uh, all that code, there's like expression trees where there's like giant switch statements that do different things based on the types. A lot of that's hidden away from you guys because it's all utility code. But at the end of the day, it has to say, okay, well, let me go look up what the type of this is. And then there's a switch statement that says, okay, if it's an integer, do this, if the float, do that, and so forth. All that adds additional overhead. So what they basically do is they look at the query plan and then they, they bake a program that executes only that query plan. And you know exactly what the type is, you know exactly what the data looks like. And therefore there aren't any conditionals, like if it's an integer to this, it's a float to that. You say, do exactly these things. You then compile that and you're basically running a program that as if it was handwritten exactly for each, each query. That's the basic idea here. Now, it doesn't come for free. Obviously there's cost in all these steps, in particular going from assembly to, to machine code, the LLVM step can take 
tens or hundreds of milliseconds. So if your query is going to run for five milliseconds, do you want to compile it for, for 300 milliseconds? Right. So there's a trade off to doing this. And so the parameterized query part is basically them a way to say, okay, if I pull out the constants, like where B equals ABC, I pull, pull all those things out. And then now I can pass those, those, those parameters at runtime to a generic program and I don't have to recompile it over and over again. So mem or sorry, single store is the most aggressive in this uh, of all the commercial systems. Postgres only compiles the where clause, the, the expression trees. Um, there's the Umbra hypersystem where they're doing the same kind of stuff, but this is this is rather unique to, to single store. They didn't invent it though. It's actually as many things in databases. This was invented by IBM in System R back in the 1970s, where they would generate assembly for every single query. But then it was a super pain in the ass to maintain because every single time you change something in you know one part of the system, you had to change the compiler piece. Because in this case, because they're generating C++ and this this uh, these opcodes and they have their own basically VM, uh, this makes this uh, makes their implementation a bit more robust to to change the underlying system. So this is a really, really cool idea. It's very hard to do. Very few systems do this. Yeah, thank you, Andy. So next, I would like to discuss our secondary index designs and how it allows us to support efficient and flexible table scan. So there are two common indexing approaches for LSM tree. So the first approach is external index, where we build an index structure outside of the LSM tree used for table storage and it maps the secondary index columns to the primary key. So this approach can also be applied to no LSM tree. However, this approach incurs an indirection in index lookup. For, for each match low, for finding the lows in the primary LSM tree storage. So this overhead is particularly significant when there are many match lows. We haven't talked about vector index yet, but I would like to mention that we think this is this might be one of the reasons why some Postgres-based vector index implementation has slower vector search performance when comparing to specialized vector databases. Also, if you use a specialized vector database together with your main database, the vector index in the specialized vector database is essentially an external index. Another common approach is to build an index for each segment. This way, the index is integrated into the primary LSM tree and therefore doesn't have the actual LSM tree lookup overhead. When comparing to the external index, this approach incurs additional O log and write application due to merge. But we found it to be an acceptable trade-off for efficient index lookup. Another problem with per-segment index is that there can be a large number of segments and we need to scan each of its index. Because the index generally has sublinear search complexity, this means that searching a larger index is cheaper than several small ones. So we extend the per segment index and have an index module that builds the index LSM tree. The background index module periodically builds cross segment uh, indexes on multiple segments. This does come up with additional O log n write amplification, but we've still found it to be favorable. The index module happens independently from segment module because different indexes have different characteristics, characteristics and may benefit from different module policy. And we don't want them to impact each other. Yeah, any questions for this? Sorry, and maybe you, maybe you said this in the beginning, like this is just another skip list for you guys? Uh, this, this is this is not skip list. This is any secondary, hash, secondary index. This includes the secondary hash index, full text index, and also the upcoming uh, uh, vector index. Ah, okay. So th these are all your okay. But if you wanted, if you wanted a, um, if you wanted a order preserving index as a secondary index, like a, on a non primary key, like is that would you get a skip list or would you get something else? Uh, we we don't have range range uh, index yet besides the primary index. Yeah, this okay. is basically talking about the index on the com store part, the com store LSM. We are, yes. I'm, I was describing different ways to build the index for the LSM tree. Okay, awesome, thanks. Yeah, yeah. basically what we do is Posema index plus index module. Yeah, so let's let's look at our secondary hash index example. It has two, two levels of index, 
the per segment index is a regular inverted index, maps the value of the maps the value to the list of low offsets in the segment with that value. The cross segment index is another hash table maps the hash of the value to a list of segment ID and starting starting location of the corresponding posting list. The index lookup involves first searching the cross segment index to find the list of segment ID and posting list offsets. Then for each select segment, use a starting posting starting posting list offset to find the low offsets. So here's a graph showing that. So we have an index column on, st on string, and this segment contains a bunch of foo and bars. The per segment index is the inverted index from the value of foo and bar to its to, to their low offsets in the segment. The cross segment index is a hash table from the hash of foo and bar to segment and posing list positions. The search starts from cross segment index, finds segment IDs and posing list offset. Then for each segment, use a posing list to find the low offsets. So comparing to the uh, per segment index alone without any index module, this improves index lookup performance from OM to O log M, where M is the number of segments. So one nice thing about per segment index and our index LSM is that it allows for you for a unified way to identify a low efficiently by segment ID and the low offset. This includes common storage, daily bits, and all kinds of segment indexes. And this allows us to correlate between them efficiently during table scale. And the unified way of identifying a low efficiently allows us to efficiently allows us to implement adaptive table scale, which is important for hybrid workloads, because hybrid workloads needs to combine different access methods and apply them in the optimal order. Static decisions made by optimizer doesn't always work because the cost depends highly on query parameters and the encodings used. So the adaptive table scan scans the table with a filter tree and it outputs loads passing the filter tree. So here is an example of a filter tree. So the leaf nodes are filters that are connected by intermediate and all nodes. So the leaf nodes are filters and they are connected by intermediate and all nodes. Some leaf nodes can be executed using index. Some are just regular filters. It can be something like a range filter for an integer column or pattern matching for a string column, or it can involve multiple columns with an arbitrary complicated expression. So the adaptive table scan involves three steps. So the first step is for each partition, we first select the segments to scan. This is done by segment elimination using cross segment index and the segment min max metadata. These steps output a list of segment IDs to scan next. Uh, do I have any questions? Okay. Yeah. Then, for e then for each segment, we use the per segment index together with the filters to select the loads to scan within that segment. Okay, everything good? Yeah, keep going. Sorry, yeah, the dog is barking. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so the second step is for each segment, we use a per segment index together with the filters to select the loads within that segment. We support filter reordering to find the optimal execution order, which we will discuss in more details in the next slide. These steps output the selection factor. Then we do row projection for each block. A block is a batch of rows uh, in, uh, for, for query processing in a segment. The default size of a batch is 4 kilos. We adaptively make the decisions to uh, whether to use sk six or scan, whether to use a column group, whether to selective decode the column or just send the encoded value to the next operation. Sorry, yeah, just, any questions? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you said the segment size is four kilo, four thousand tuples or four thousand four thousand kilobytes. Or four, four uh, the second one, the second one size is is one million rows. The a batch of rows is basically a batch of rows for core processing. That's four k rows. Uh, four four thousand tuples or four four kilo, kilobytes. Yes, of uh, uh, four thousand rows, top four thousand tuples. Got it. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is basically adaptive table scan. Everything fits in these three steps. So now let's talk about the filtering uh, in more detail in, in more details. So the reason we need filter reordering is because there are different ways to evaluate filters, each with different trade-offs. It can be executed as a regular filter where we selectively decode the column that executes the filter. It can also be executed as an encoded filter where well, the encoded filter executes directly on compressor data. So one good example would be dictionary encoding with a small number of values. So group filter runs several filters in a group instead of running them separately. This is good if the selectivity of each individual filter is low. So index filter reads the index and finds the filtered low, low offsets. It's usually better to it's usually better to run the index filter using the index than as a regular filter, but it can still be worse if the other filters already filter filter the result to a few rows. So single store supports adapt adaptive filter or reordering for each 4K block of rows. The way it does is each segment for each segment we estimate the cost of each strategy by timing it on a small number of rows. Then each block will, will reorder the filters based on the cost M estimate and the selectivity from previous block. Yeah, uh, any questions so far? So this is basically the overview for single store um, architecture with, a, with an emphasis on the query processing part. Can you talk a little bit about when you actually run a query, uh, you mentioned is it vectorized execution, SIMD stuff, uh, but like you have, you're getting data, from, you're getting rows and you're getting columns or vectors of column or portions of columns. Like in your query engine, is it converting everything into a single form? Like it's like a, everything becomes a column store, everything becomes a row store, or do you have separate execution engine pieces for like the row store and column store stuff? That if you understand my question, like what, what yeah, is the yes. columns look like? Yeah, for column store, we convert the low segment into com in, into column store. So so it will always be a batch. Uh, it will also always be a batch of flows, but um, uh, but but we, but we can basically we, we the, the batch of the, it's a general interface that supports the internal the internal represent representation to be both row store format and a com store format, and uh, we, we we can execute on both. But it has a general interface that's all. Output that doesn't need to, or the operator doesn't need to be uh, worry about that. I, I haven't read the Sigma paper yet, but like within like scans, you can do you're doing like vectorized. You, again, I think you mentioned using SIMD for that as well, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you, can you say publicly like do you go up to AVX five twelve or just AVX two? Um, I think it's only AVX two. Okay. Okay. Awesome, thanks. Also, we auto detect the CPU capability and uh, decide which instruction set to use. Of course, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. All right, any questions from the class? I have a question. Do you have specialized SIMD code or are you just using basic like GCC or Clang optimizations for it? Uh, 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 we write the SMID instructions ourselves for, for, certain, oh, okay. for certain operations. Presumably, there's intrinsics, right? Yes. Yeah. We also okay. intrinsics from the GCC. Got it. Any other questions for the class? And actually, can you briefly talk about the Wasm stuff? Like, you, so you're you're compiling UDFs from written by your customers, uh, and I think you, you guys still support the MPL, the the. Or, or or you used probably the single store programming language. There was like there was or MemSQL programming language. There was like a, you guys had your own version of PLPG SQL 
but then you could then paralyze that. And you, is that you're still doing that? And then, but you compile down the wasm and, and you execute things as wasm. Um. So 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 we basically support three different extensibility. We support you write UDFs in MP SQL, and we support you write it in wasm. We support it written in um. Uh, written external function. So the only difference is that so during the core execution, there will be some places you will make a function call to call the UDF. So for the MP SQL, you call the compiled, basically compiled MP SQL functions. In the Wasm case, you invoke the Wasm runtime to run the already compiled Wasm code. In the external functions case, you just make a network call to call the external service. So we have a Watson runtime setting next to the engine and just uh, compile the Watson code for us. Got it. And did you, I mean, this is getting off topic. Do you do any introspection to like, yeah, obviously for the external functions you can't, but for like the, I think whatever, the M, M, M SQL thing, like for the, the local UDS, do you do any, any introspection to understand what it's actually doing to help you get cost model estimates about the output of the, of the function call, like like Microsoft does some, some something similar like this, or some, something based on this. Like, are you looking inside the UDF at all to make sense of what's going on? Um, I'm not too sure about that. Yeah. Uh, we we definitely compile the MPC code during the compilation. We probably do some optimization. Got it. Um, okay. But for Watson and external function, I don't, I don't, I don't think we do anything. I mean, you, I mean, you can't. It's external. You can't yeah, do anything. Can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Question. Yeah. So. Um, from what I understand, the way you handle both analytical and transactional workloads is um, you can create a table to be either a row store or a column store, right? Yeah, it is a, both a row store and a column store, but it's a row store set on top of the column store as a catch. Oh, so every table you make is both row and column store. Yes, yeah, it's so, a single column, a single table type. Okay, and and the row so the row store is in memory and the column store is in disk. Is that the distinction? Yeah, that's correct. The okay. reason is we cannot make the user to choose which one to use. And it also doesn't make sense to make the choice because the hybrid workload might involve both workloads. OK. So we need then, to, to do both. Mm -hmm. if, if the row store runs out of, if, if you run out of space for the row store in memory, then I guess, I guess you spill some of it to disk as well. Yeah, like the, the, store, the row store segment is supposed, is supposed to be small, and the background flash will periodically flash the row store segment to on disk com store segment. OK, just making sure I understand. Thanks. It's the same thing yeah, as yeah. long-term storage. It's just what gets written out as columns, not rows. Whereas when we talked about it, it was hey, the row gets dumped out. Yeah. OK, nice. I think nice. the high-level architecture is similar. Though. I think the additional work we do is we make our column store uh, can allow for a operational workload. Basically, we allow it to uh, allow allows for fast seek and uh, fast seek and fast find any, any, any of the load. Again, when when it was called MemSQL, original MemSQL was just a in-memory skip list, right? In-memory row store. Then they added a column store, but it was like as you said, you had to declare whether you want a row store table or a column store table. The single store name when they changed it, obviously, was because okay, now it's one table type, and you don't care what you know, uh, you don't care how it's being stored. It just handles everything for you. Okay, right? Which is, in my opinion, is the right way to do it. All right, keep going. Good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so so we finished the single store architecture. So in the second half, so yeah, so in the second half of the talk, I will talk about how we build vector nest in single store. So uh, before we go into the details, let's start with a quick quick crash course on vector search. So vector search involves uh, n vectors and another query vector, and the goal is to find k nearest neighbors to the query vector. All the vectors are dense and in a d-dimensional space. And the vector similarity is measured by some distance metric. The common distance metrics are Euclidean distance, dot product, and cosine similarity. Finding the exact k nearest neighbors can be slow, so people look into the approximate version called ANN, approximate nearest neighbor. And the accuracy of ANN is measured by the ratio of exact k nearest neighbors found, called recall. So vector search is empowered by representation learning. Representation learning learns to represent objects with vector embeddings with a guarantee that semantic, sem sem semantic similar objects are closer to each other. For example, the, the text describes the picture below. Uh, 
so so their vector embeddings will be close, while the vector embedding of a random audio will be far away. So vector search gains a lot of popularity recently due to generative AI. In generative AI, you ask a question to the generative model like ChatGPT, and it will give you an answer. But those generative models are trade on old and public data and are unaware of new and domain-specific knowledge. It is possible to retrain a new model or fine-tune an existing model to incorporate new and domain-specific knowledge. But that's inefficient and, and costly to do. On the other hand, Retrieval augmented generation, or RAG, is a cost-efficient approach to generative AI. You start by gathering all the documents for your need and use, a, and use an embedding model to generate the document embeddings. Now, when a question comes, you use the same embedding model to generate a question embedding. Then you do a vector search on document embeddings and a question embedding to find the relevant document. Now you pass both the question and the relevant document to the generative model and use in-context learning to produce a more relevant answer. So REC can also help reduce generative AI hallucination because it provides some, kind of, some sort of source citation to the relevant document. So vector search is not the only way to retrieve text. In fact, single store has support for full text search for several years. The difference between vector search and full text search is that full text search relies on keyword matching and it doesn't capture uh, and, and can capture semantics. Moreover, vector search can be much model and it can be used to search for not only text but also image, audio, and video, etc. However, vector search is more computationally costly compared to full text search. We believe that both vector search and full text search are important, and a single store provides a usual friendly interface to use them both together with, with, with other database features. So vector index algorithm is a hot research topic. People have developed many good vector index algorithms, and new ones are be being proposed every year. The existing ones can largely be categorized into four groups tree-based, hash-based, quantization-based, and graph-based. Tree-based algorithms like KD tree are most effective in low dimension, but degrees exponentially with high dimension. Hash-based algorithms use lo locality-sensitive hashing to build hash table for similarity instead of exact search. So hash-based algorithms use locality-sensitive hashing to build hash table for similarity instead of exact match. It has good worst case theoretical bound, but needs many hash tables to amplify its accuracy at the cost of increased search time in that size, making it impractical in high dimension. So the popular approaches are quantization-based and graph-based. So quantization-based algorithm partitions vectors into clusters of nearby vectors so that search can be done by scanning a small set of clusters. Graph-based algorithms build proximity graph that factors are connected to its neighbors so that neighborhood can be searched efficiently. So quantization-based and graph-based algorithms are so far the best and the most popular in practice. Most vector index algorithms are fully in memory, but there are a few that are optimized for on-disk use that have small memory footprint while also offering good search performance. Some vector index algorithms can also be run in GPU and get better performance. Let's look deeper into two common popular vector index algorithms, IVF and HNSW. So IVF or inverted if file, it, basic, uh, it partitions uh, vectors into clusters and it uses centers to represent each cluster. It builds inverted index from cluster to centers to it builds an inverted index from clusters or centrals to vectors. And during the search, it first finds the nearby centrals to the query vector and only searches within nearby centrals. And next, we'll look, look at the popular graph-based algorithm called the hierarchical navigable, navigable small world or HNSW. So I'm going through this algorithm very quickly. 
the details of the algorithm doesn't matter that much. I'm just giving you a feeling of the algorithm. So in HNSW, it can you can so you can think of it as a skip list of approximate graph. Each node is only connected to a small number of neighbors, and the search is kind of greedy, starting from the closest layer, up layer, and refine with with lower layers. Yeah, so the exact de details of IVF and HNSW algorithm are not important for this for this talk, but I want to give a quick comparison between the two to show that there is no one algorithm dominates the other. So HNSW has higher recall than IVF. It's also faster to search. The complexity is about O log n versus O squared over n for a common parameter setting. On the other hand, IVF is faster to build and, a small, and has smaller index size. I would also like to mention product quantization or PQ. It is a vector compression technique that applies to various algorithms, example, IVF-PQ and HNSW-PQ. It not only saves space, but also speeds up distance computation. However, compression is lossy, so it usually needs to refine the result for better recall. So vector index algorithm can also be composed. Recall that searching nearest neighbors in IVF index involves first searching nearest centers which is yet another ANN problem, and it can be speeded up by another vector index. For example, IVF plus HNSW builds a HNSW on IVF centrals. This is particularly good because HNSW has a large index size, but it's, also, it's, but it's now built on a smaller number of centrals, while HNSW has high recall, which is crucial for searching nearly centrals in IVF. So let's look at the vector search offerings in the market. Know that the data here is somewhat outdated. So we have a large number of, of specialized vector database and also existing database vendors adding vector search support. The point I want to highlight here is that many advanced ones do support different vector index algorithms because they provide different but meaningful trade-offs. So that being said, single stores so yeah, that being said, the main point I want to make here is that single stores vector search is implemented in an algorithm agnostic approach that allows us to plug in any vector index algorithm. And we commit to adding more vector index algorithms with different characteristics and improve the existing ones. So now let's see how we build vector index at single store. Oh, by the way, do we have any questions so far? Just about the overview. So it's a very quick one. I think we we covered. I mean, we had a lot of speakers this this semester talk about their vector vector databases. So I think a lot of students have seen this stuff before. This is good. Okay. Good. Yeah. So now let's see how we build vector index at single store. So recall that single store table is our own disk com store LSM plus a in memory uh, low store segment. So your question was, how do you provide the same plugin for memory-based index and disk-based index? I, um, so 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 basically for yeah yeah uh, I think it might be more apparent when I talk about how how we build the index for uh, in, in this section. Okay. Basically, if we, yeah. Basically, the idea is we build an index for each segment, and we have an index module. So. Uh, yeah, it, it basically it, it, we are using the vector index in a in in, in, in as, a, as a black box. Well, we don't care about the internal workings of the vector index. Yeah, so recall. Uh, yeah, so we build a vector index. Oh, uh, yeah. So because the in-memory low store segment is very small, so we don't need to build a vector index uh, there, and we can just rely on brute force search. We only build vector index for own disk com store LSM. And in particular, we start by building vector index for each segment, use, uh, then use a background vector index module to merge several small per segment vector index into one larger cross segment vector index or multiple segments. Yeah, so 
the way it does is basically background flasher and module creates a new vector index for each new segment created. Auto table will create a new vector index for each existing segment. An update delete will just mark the load delete in the segment. We will rely on delete bits to filter them out during search. But if too many loads get delete in a, in a segment, we rebuild its vector index. And similar to other segment indexes, vector indexes have sublinear search complexity. And therefore, searching a larger uh, index is cheaper than several small indexes. So we also have a vector index module that builds a vector index LSM tree. The background vector index module periodically builds cross-segment vector index on multiple segments. So unlike hash index, there is, there is no two level indexes here. The cross-segment vector index is just regular vector index, but spans across multiple segments. This does come up with an additional O log n write implication due to index merge. And it's more significant here because vector index is, is expensive to build. So we only do merge, uh, we, we do merge less frequently and we only do it on code data. Yeah, so I hope this answers the question how we combine both in-memory uh, vector index algorithm and on-disk uh, vector index algorithm because we are just using it in a back, in a back box way. Yeah, so one nice thing about this design is that we are using it as a black box. So this allows us to plug in any vector index algorithms. In 8.5, which is coming this January, we support many popular in-memory vector index algorithms. Is vector search deterministic? I think, again, the um, answer. Yeah, it, it is not it, yeah, it is not deterministic because vector search is kind of approximate. So when you build it for example, even if even for the same vector index algorithm, it's probably that um for the same segment you it will always choose the same top k. But de depending how you are going to model your vector index, you will build you you will build the index in different ways, then the result can be different. So there's really no deterministic guarantee. Yeah, so in 8.5, we support many popular in-memory vector index algorithms. So this includes IVF flat, IVF PQ, IVF PQ fast scan, HNSW flat, and HNSWPQ. So we support all the uh, state-of-art algorithms. Post 8.5, we are planning to support on-disk vector index algorithms. Another nice thing that Another nice thing is that vector index can be built on an uh, external device. We are actively exploring external vector index build device using GPU. Also, it can be hard for average users to pick the best vector ind index algorithms for a given task. So there's a one more question. Maybe the basic uh, Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to explain it right now. Yeah. So it can be hard for average users to pick the best vector index algorithms for a given task. It is even harder to choose various parameters a given vector index algorithm provides. Because our vector index is always built on immutable data, we can try different algorithms ourselves and pick the best one for the user. We can even train a machine learning model to do so. Moreover, we can use different vector index algorithms for different sets of segments. The user just need to tell us what the requirements are. For example, how much recall they want, are there any memory limitations, etc. And we can build auto index, auto vector index that selects the vector index algorithms together with its parameters for the user. Yeah, so this is how we build the vector index at single score. Uh, do we have any questions so far? Did you guys, uh, I think you mentioned this before, like you, you didn't implement all these these indexes yourself. Are you just using like FAST or something off the shelf? Yeah, so we just use existing uh, vector index, index libraries and we can plug in any libraries. We can use FACE, we can use HNSW and so on and so forth. 
I mean, so, so what do what do you guys use? Like, can you can you say? Right now, we, right now we use Face, but yeah, we plan to use HNSWlib next because the HNSW implementation in Face is is not that efficient. Got it. I should point out. So another question from Avery in the chat. I should point out also too. She also works on a the, the PG vector RS, the Rust based vector index search for Postgres. That's why she has a lot of questions. So her question is, how do you handle filtering with graph based indexes like HNSW? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to talk about the vector search part in, in the next section. So this section is only about vector index. Uh, any questions for the index build? OK, great. Yeah, so let's talk about vector search at single store. Um, yeah, so before we're talking about any filter, so let's start uh, looking at uh, a regular ANN query where there is no filters. Let's start with a simple case. So this kind of vector search can be represented in SQL using order by limit. For example, we have a table T here with a vector column. And in finding k nearest neighbors to a query uh, can natively be written as a SQL, as a, as a SQL select query, where we select t, the Euclidean distance t dot v between t dot v and the vector as, as distance d from table t and order by d limit, limit k. So here, the special operator is a shorthand symbol uh, for computing Euclidean distance. So, uh, so this vector search can be executed by what we call order by limit pushdown. So aggregator already pushes down order by limit to leaves. It's currently, by, it's currently down by selecting top k from each leaf, then do a merge sort. But it, but it is also possible to select less than k rows from each leaf initially, and then iteratively select more rows. So let's focus on the leaves because the aggregator part is we, we know how to do the push down. So the harder part is, uh, on, is on the leaf. So on leaves, vector search can be done by pushing down order by limit to table scan or the top filter. The top filter will scan the vector index and selects top k rows. So here is how the execution plan looks like on leaves. Again, we are ignoring the aggregator part. So the table scan on T has a top filter and it selects top k rows. The notation in the notation index next to next to top filter means that the filter will be executed using vector index. Vector index scan only scans the vector index, but not the table. So the distance it computes might be approximate. For example, in the case when PQ is, in, is used. So there's another top sort that reads the selected vectors from the table and a sort based on exact distance. It's basically the refinement of PQ. It is possible to skip reading the table if the distance in vector index is exact, or is, if the user is found with approximate distance. Um, so let's see how we can fit vector search in our adaptive table scan we talked about earlier. So the filter tree in this case is very simple. It just contains one top filter for the vector index scan. It's a single node, single filter node. And the vector search is done during the per partition segment selection. During per partition segment selection, we scan all vector indexes within the partition and select top k for the entire partition. And the top filter will basically evaluate to true if and only if the row is top k within the partition. Yeah, before we go to the filters, are there any questions for the basic ANN without any filters? I think you're good. OK. Yeah, now let's try to uh, use vector search with other filters. Say we want to find top k vectors with a, with a certain property. This can be represented in SQL using a where clause. So this becomes problematic because we need to output k rows passing the filter. But if we run the vector in the scan to select k rows, then run through the filter, there will be less rows after filters. So we can let the vector in the scan to anticipate that 
and output more load than needed at the beginning. But, it in, but in practice, this is very hard to predict how many loads are needed for vector in scale. So therefore, the filters need to be executed before the vector in scale. And we do that by make vector in filter aware of its pre-filters. So here is how the execution plan looks like. The filters are now pushed down into the top filter so that the vector index scan can be aware of them. And the semantics of the top filter becomes that it will output top K loads post its pre-filters. So this way, we are not changing the semantics of the query if we push down the filter to the, to the top filter. So this is how we are going to execute. Remember that top filter for vector index scan is executed during poor partition segment, seg segment selection. So I'm, not, I'm ignoring the, the other two steps in adaptive table scan. So we first run segment animation with pre-filters. This reduces the number of false positive from vector index scan. We, we then scan all vector indexes within the filtered segments and select top L for the entire partition. Here, L is some value we choose based on the estimate, based on the estimate selectivity of pre-filters. We then run pre-filters on these top L loads. Some loads will be filtered out. If there are at least K output loads, then we are good, and we just select top K among them. If there are less than K output loads, we need to either retry, retry step B with a larger L, or if we decide vector index scan is worse, then just fall back to not using vector index scan at all. Basically, the, uh, yeah, so basically to answer average's question, what we do is basically we use vector index scan, then run the filter, and uh, if, if it produces less loads, we just retry. We retry the vector index scan to produce more loads. The retry is fun because the retry is kind of local to the to the to the vector index filter, and we haven't write anything to the to the later output. So so we can just retry there. Yeah. So any questions about the, how we handle uh, vac vector index filter with with filters? Okay, we're good. Okay. Oh, qu question. Sorry. Uh, why would we? Yeah, because, Go ahead. Yeah, be because if you look at this SQL query, the goal is that uh, we want to run filters. Then after we run filters, we run we want to order by the distance, and we we want to output k loads. So we want to output k loads in total. But the problem is that. Uh, if we execute vector index scan first and we output k loads, then we run the filter. The filter will filter out some loads. Then we output less loads, because the selectivity of filters is is unpredictable. So there's just no way to estimate how many loads vector index scan needs to output. Uh, yeah, so yeah, l let's talk a little bit more about top filters. So uh, we believe this is something that can not only be this is this is a basically order by limit is a, like a general uh, push push down. It can be a general push down, and top filter can be used for even outside of vector index. Even though right now we don't know how to use it. So uh, in the general case, so the top filter takes in an expression. A, a filter tree and a limit k. The semantics of the top filter is, is that it evaluates to true if the expression of this law ranks within the top k among all the laws passing filters. So it is just a regular leaf node in the filter tree. And it can be used even for non-vector index scan. So in the general case, there can be many top filters in the filter tree with different pre-filters. Filters outside of the top filter are post filters, and the top filter itself has pre filters. 
filter reordering can happen within pre-filter tree and post-filter tree. So one good thing of how we execute this top filter is that the retry logic only happens within the top filter. It's safe to do so because we haven't output any loads to the next, op next operator. So uh, now let's see. So uh, we can even do joins. We, uh, because the vector data is stored in SQL database, it might be common to use vector search with join, where the filters are applied on one table while the vector search is done on another table. So here is an example of doing that. So yeah, just read the SQL query. And so this can be executed by first scanning the table S with its filters. Then we build a hash table on filtered loads. Then we do a vector index scan with a pre-filter. And the, and the pre-filter basically, basically just checks if there is a matching load in the hash table. Yeah, so basically we can do, we can do joins with, with, with vector search. So this is something like the vector databases usually don't do. It is even possible that we can combine full text search and vector search. Yeah, so here is the semantics. So Elastic Search also allows you to have a way to combine full text search and vector search. So here is the semantics, and I want to show that we can also do it in SQL. So, uh, so, so in an elastic search, each so semantic is basically the user can specify a query, and each query contains multiple sub queries, and each sub query has its own type. It can be either a full text query or it can be a vector search query. For a given row, each sub query produces a score. The final score is a weighted sum of all individual scores, and the query basically selects the rows with the highest final score. The way, the way that search executes it is by executing each individual sub query separately as a filter to select rows that have a positive score for that sub query. For the, for the ANN query, it has a positive score if it's top K. Otherwise, it, it just think uh, it's, it's not going to select it. It is then, it then union all the rows selected by each sub queries and then compute the final score for all the rows output in step two and output the highest, one, highest ones. Yeah, again, this is just the semantics from um, Elasticsearch. There might be other ways to combine uh, factor search with full text, but this is just one way of doing that. I'm just showing that we can do it. We can do these semantics in SQL. So here is how we can represent such SQL query, such query in SQL. So know that there is a where clause of filter that we only want output k loads passing those filters, and we want to find the highest weighted score over full text and vector search. And the execution plan looks something like this. We will basically do a table scan on T. And the filter tree involves two crosses. The fourth cross is, uh, is, for foot, is, is for foot text in that scan, and it's end with the filters. So single store already supports this using foot text with other filters. Foot text doesn't have this weird semantics. So the second cross is for vector in that scan, as the filters are pushed down to the vector in that scan. So we are able to construct a filter tree for this case, and uh, we can just execute that, and the scores are projected out and then sorted by the weighted sum. Yeah, are there any questions for the drawing and the foot X case? Can you go back to the join? Like, is the vector a column in a table? And are you joining two tables based on how similar that column is? Like, I wasn't sure how exactly that works. Oh, yeah. So here, the join condition is basically, the join condition is not on vector. It's, a, it's oh, on okay. attribute matching. It is, yeah, what, what it, it's a good question that we also consider vector index join, where it's a join by the vector similarity. Uh, I didn't put it in a slide, but we also have discussed uh, talk about discuss that internally. Okay. 
doesn't really make sense if you join on the vectors themselves because they're not human understandable. Right? You call it some transformer, then it spits out this, you know, uh, you know, uh, thousand float vector. And you you don't know what any of the values mean. It's just like any input can I transform it to a vector in the same high dimensional space, and then I do my similarity search. So joining vectors doesn't make sense, but joining uh, two tables based on something about the vector index makes sense potentially. I see. Okay. I, I feel yeah. like this is, I mean, this is like, you said this is the elastic way, but it's like, I, I, I don't know the answer, but I feel like it's, it's the most inefficient way to do this. It's like, hey, let me run the one example where you're like, okay, I'm going to pull out all the subqueries and run them individually, even though they might be correlated and I could, I could roll them into a join, uh, which is the best way to do it, to execute it. But, but like, I don't think you can because it's this weird semantics of like, yeah, find things that kind of match in this loosey goosey way. Um, yeah. I think it's so. We are not sure what are other ways to put a vector search in SQL query. There might be, I mean, as you, as you mentioned, the semantics of that SQL query basically enforce us to execute in that way. Yeah. But there might be other ways to put vector search in. SQL query that allows for more efficient execution, but we don't know. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So back in yeah. So this is the last page. So backending index can also be used elsewhere other than regular A and N vector search. Uh, one example is to do vector range search. Well, the well we want to find all vectors whose distances to a target vector fall in a certain range. So this can also be done efficiently with, with vector index. Another interesting example is maximal marginal relevance, or MMR. In MMR, instead of searching k nearest neighbors, it searches for k representatives of nearest neighbors, where new neighbors can't be too close to previously selected neighbors. So this can also be built uh, on top of a regular NN vector search. Yeah, thank you. So I do want to mention that some of the things I talk about in these slides, uh, we, we haven't implemented in 8.5. Uh, things like vector index merger and a filtered ANN, it's not implementing 8.5. But we do have uh, many other things. Uh, most of other things we, we already covered in 8.5. Uh, yeah, because we are a small team working on vector index at single store. And uh, yeah, we also, but we do plan to support them all in the upcoming releases. Yeah, any questions? Okay, I will applaud on behalf of the, well, uh, yeah, well, too. Uh, Thank you. All right, we have time for a few questions for Cheng. So what would, what's a sort of one sentence summary you can give that, that differentiates like single store from like Postgres or MySQL or SQLite or DuckDB and some of the systems that the students may be aware of. Like what's the, like, why would someone choose single store over another system? I, I think the main uh, differentiator is that we are a general purpose database that can work for a variety of, of workloads. We can handle both operational and transactional workloads. We can handle like structure, unstructured, data, and we have a lot of other features. Got it, awesome, good. And then plus the scale out stuff, plus the compilation. Yeah, yeah, the scales. It's very fast. It scales very well. And you, and you gave us all without mentioning lock free. I appreciate that. That was good. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, guys. Uh, again, thank you, Chang, for spending an hour with us. This is super, super insightful. All right, class. So on Wednesday, uh, two days from now, that'll be in person, back at the lecture hall. And then we'll start off with the uh, review for the final exam. I will post the website and the practice final uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, and then if you haven't yet, please go vote for what system you want to learn about. Again, you can't vote for single store because we just learned about single store. So pick another database system. Okay. And then uh, I will try to do as many data systems I can cover in, in an hour. Okay. All right. Again, Cheng, thank you so much for spending time with us. Appreciate it. And then everyone, have a good rest of your day. Good luck with the rest of your classes. See ya. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Bye bye. <laughs>
happy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 is send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great. 